Hello? Can, hey, you, can say you say something? Me? Yes. Yes, awesome. we can hear you. Can hear us. Right, perfect. Good morning. Uh, good morning. Good morning. Thanks for having me. Hi. Okay. I'm nervous. <laughs> so we are starting uh, today's session. Yeah. Okay. You want to? Uh, can start? I like, give yeah. us? Oh, yeah. thank you so much for joining, Sergey. Um, we will. Uh, we're so excited and we're looking forward to hearing from you a lot about the Facebook and your career-wise advices for our students. And thank you so much for joining today's session. And we here we have uh, dozens of students are looking forward to talk to you, ask the questions. And we'll have a, a vulnerable session, I hope. Thank you so much for joining today. Absolutely. Thanks for having me. So I just hope it's going, it's going to be a very interactive session. So, uh, so I'll talk a little bit about myself, about my career background. And hopefully, we, I'll, I'll, I'll receive a lot of questions from you that I'll be happy to answer. OK? Awesome. OK, Sergey, let Thank me you. introduce you to the audience. Sure. Uh, so Sergey uh, is a graduate of Kazakh British Technical University. Yeah. Uh, as far as I remember, he entered uh, this university in 2007. And seven, and yes. Graduated in 2011. Uh, he was one of the top students in our university and worked in Silicon Valley in Bay Area for quite a long time. And his last employment was at uh, Facebook, right? Yes. Okay. Okay, and he is now looking for new opportunities. Uh, so he's back to Kazakhstan and wants to join uh, other companies, right? Yeah, yeah, not really, but I can chances. come to or, this a bit later. Okay, uh, so here from our side, this is a, a students, some of the students from of British Management University. Uh, at, the, at the Zoom session, the Zoom session has, was started by Zane. That's the Thank guy. Thank you. That, that's me. Yeah. So he arranged and organized this whole thing. Uh, we also have uh, Mr. Golib. Uh, he is a vice rector of uh, university's development. And we also have Hi. joined uh, Munisa, right? Who is Munisa? I think uh, the link is shared on our social media, ah, okay, okay. but the so people who are teacher, interested, she, they will join. She is our, I think, English teacher, right? Yeah, maybe. maybe. Okay. We don't know yet. So, Sergey, the floor is yours. I think uh, you will introduce yourself in more detail. Tell about your sure. success story. And then uh, students will have questions, I hope. Okay, and we will turn to Q&A session shortly after that. Yeah, absolutely. So let me, let me start. And uh, so let's maybe start from like the university times. Uh, so before the university, uh, I just studied in a simple like school in a small town in the west of Kazakhstan. Uh, the population of the town is just 35,000 people. Uh, it's called Aksai. And nothing special about the school, but uh, I, I was lucky enough to enter a Kazakh British Technical University in Almaty uh, when I was 18 years old. And um, I'll just be honest in full disclosure. So I entered the university without any uh, prior background in computer science, right? Because nowadays, and actually during my times as well, there were lots of students who had some Olympic programming background, for example, did some informatics and stuff. And when I actually joined, like uh, my first lines of code were in Java and it was just absolutely like some, some nonsense to me when they tell you like to write public static or in main and you don't know a single word what, what it actually means. Uh, that was when I was 18. But uh, so I started coding at the university and uh, Later on, I, I would say I would attribute uh, a lot of success in the career uh, to the interest in the Lipid programming, uh, which was very popular in our, in our university. And I think it's pretty popular in Uzbekistan as well, because the semifinals of the uh, ACM, ICPC, Olympic programming are held in Tashkent. I was in Tashkent once, by the way, so for the semifinals. How did and, you like it? Yeah, it was amazing. Um, well, what I remember a lot is like the food was amazing. People were very nice, and I actually came back with like leftover money because everything was so cheap. <laughs> so, Thank you. So we were given some stipend on like uh, to buy food and stuff. It was amazing. I mean, so yeah, I really liked it. So, but it was just once when I would say the year was maybe 2009 or so. And uh, so, uh, even though Timur Faridovich says that I was like in the top 
top students like at the university i wouldn't quite agree with that um, i would say that like i was just like a regular guy and like who started coding just at the university and just i was just grinding and grinding and kept on growing my like expertise and i remember like at the university there were other folks with a lot of background but eventually it kind of levels out right like as you know like uh, in other spheres and in other specialties uh, basically if you keep on going and if the others are not actually improving you can actually reach their level and even surpass them but uh yeah nothing special after the university so after the university i started to work in a startup in uh astana which is now called north sultan which is our capital and over there i worked like uh, in a startup where we were working on like the online booking system for buying tickets for cinemas and theaters and museums and other things and at the same time uh, actually because of my background in elliptic programming which i gained during university i was also invited to uh, coach um, elliptic programming team in azerbaijan university and Actually, we had I had a lot of success over there. I would say because I was learning myself quite a lot about the algorithms, data structures, how to teach the courses. Because you know, like I I don't know. Do you guys have like a background in IT over here, or like is it mostly management? Uh, um, no, currently, we're a management university. We offer uh, mainly in finance and banking system, but. At the same time, we also provide a minor in IT. So the students who are actually studying for investment and banking and finance and accounting, they will also have the basic knowledge about uh, uh, IT programs. They're not really hardcore programming or um, uh, a difficult coding language, but they will understand the basics about the code programming. But they, if they are keen on learning more, there is a lot of opportunity in Tashkent. They can learn a lot. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks for the clarification, Zane. So I would say like I was, I was coaching the teams in Azerbaijan University on Olympic programming for two, two and a half years or so. And I personally learned a lot during those times because if you want to teach something, you're supposed to know this like from ground up, right? It's not like you, when you're studying during university, when you just, all you need, to, uh, basically when you're at the university by yourself and you have goals to submit some problems, right? You want to be able to solve some types of problems. You don't actually learn this stuff very deeply, uh, deeply enough. But when you have to teach this, it's actually quite a different level of expertise, right? Because you need to know this from ground up. You, you need to be able to answer any questions that your students have. So because you don't want to embarrass yourself, right? And uh, so I would say that was helping me quite a lot because uh, the coding interviews in the companies are mostly composed of uh, programming questions. Uh, and I would say Olympia programming is probably overkill in this sense, but I can speak about this more uh, later. So uh, in 2014, I, I was I had an opportunity. Actually, one of my friends and former co-workers, uh, he was able to find a job in a startup in Silicon Valley, and startup was named is named Ipsy. It's basically a beauty subscription service uh, where they offer makeup products and uh, personalized uh, makeup products. And there is quite a lot of technology behind this uh, because of the personalization part of things. And I was I was referred by my friends, and and the, I got the first opportunity to uh, to interview with a Bay Area company uh, through Skype, just like we had like Skype sessions and like a few like coding questions, right? And maybe some background checks and just like some small system design questions, right? Like nothing special. But it wasn't hard, but uh, I would say that I got there, like, first of all, by the reputation, because if the company is bringing you from overseas, uh, they want to have some kind of connection, right? They want to know who, whom they are bringing, right? And, and if you have somebody who can vouch for you, uh, so who can say, okay, I know this guy or this girl, and uh, they are actually a great engineer, so you should get him or them, right? Uh, so that's actually, I would say that's... Uh, that's the main ticket to success like everywhere so as long as you can build the reputation beforehand so reputation is very important like uh, in life and you will eventually find out that the world is so small and even even if you work in big tech companies everybody knows everyone so and if you actually screw up somewhere <laughs> so some people will know this you're actually doing amazing people will know this as well
and you will you will actually find someone through the second handshake or third handshake who can actually watch for you or say something bad about you. So uh, I got my first job in the Bay Area through the just like uh, interviews over Skype, and I was lucky enough to apply for a work visa, H-1B visa, and I got selected in the lottery. The lottery at that time was something like 40% chances to get selected. So there was a little bit of luck over there. And that's how I landed um, in San Francisco in 2014. So I worked in the startup uh, for three and a half years. And I was mainly working like, first I was like just a full stack engineer doing both backend and front end development. Uh, later on, I was switching more into backend systems and then into data, big data systems. And then I was working more on the personalization part of the of the system. So just to tell you like in a few words what the startup was doing, let's say you have like hundreds of products every month and you have like a million customers and you hundreds of different types of products and like some products are like 5,000, some products are like 100,000, some products are half a million. And you want to compose uh, bags with five makeup products inside. And the products have to be personalized for the customers because you don't want to send some mascara to someone who doesn't fit their eye color or like something like that. And the personalization behind that, like we were doing a, like mixing integer programming problem optimization over there. And then we're like scaling this uh, to use like big data technologies to assign the bags properly uh, to different customers. So it's a bit, technical but uh, at the end of the world like it was great experience i would say and after maybe 2017 i thought that I, I i i wanted to grow like further and so the startup was a little bit small for me and i wanted to get more challenges and so i started to look for a job like in other places of course there was some like good preparation beforehand and i had to prepare for the interviews for the system design questions for the coding questions and how it works in the Bay Area is basically, you don't typically go and like, okay, I want to work at Facebook and I just go and interview with Facebook and that's it, right? Uh, what you do in, in reality, you go and interview with different companies at the same time, right? So in my case, I was interviewing with Uber, Airbnb, uh, Facebook and Google. And, and basically I went through the rounds of the interviews. Some weeks were pretty busy. Let's say in one week I was had I had like three sessions of interviews. Let's say with Google, Facebook, and Airbnb. That was like a pretty dance week, and I had an opportunity to get offers from all the companies, all the four companies. And then you basically just decide like where you want to land. And there is a negotiation process, right? Because like you want to make sure that you will succeed in the company. You make you need to make sure that like the compensation is good, so that like, you are paid like fairly and. And there are many different factors as well. And so based on different like uh, weighing in different like options, I decided to join Facebook at that time. And I can speak about the reasons why I joined Facebook instead of Google, for example, because I think like in our Central Asian countries, it's a common thing like to like dream about working at Google, for example, right? Uh, and- It is, it is. Yeah, exactly. So, so, as you live like in the Bay Area and you realize actually uh, the opportunities that you actually can get in the companies, you make decisions accordingly, right? So uh, Google at that time, four years ago was a pretty huge company. Even at that time, I think they already had like over 50,000 employees. Right now it's not employees, but actually engineers. Uh, right now it's probably 80,000 plus engineers at Google. Uh, if I was looking at Facebook and I saw uh, a lot more opportunities, uh, because uh, yes, uh, at Facebook basically, I saw that like say valuation of the company yeah. was at that time maybe half a bill, half a trillion, right? And Google was maybe eight hundred billion dollars uh, valuation of the company. But at the same time, Facebook had uh, like more than three times less engineers, so it means there was more work. Right, and more work means more opportunities, more opportunities for impact. While when you're in a bigger company, uh, you're actually, sorry, that's my dog. Uh, while you're in a bigger company, it's actually very easy to get lost over there because there are so many of people just like you, right? And you're just doing some regular job and it's easier to find the comfort zone when you're actually not growing. And 
and uh, you're just like staying in the company you have this golden handcuffs of like great uh, compensation and uh, very nice uh, schedule and everything and like good like perks like laundry and everything right and gym and everything so that was my decision about Facebook. I thought I was still pretty young. At the time, I was 27 years old. And I could actually afford uh, to work a bit extra, but uh, to get more opportunities. So that's why I joined Facebook at that time. So Facebook years were pretty wild, right, I would say. So when I joined the company, first year was pretty tough. Uh, as you know, like Facebook is one of the worst in terms of uh, work-life balance. As, at least that's the reputation, how it's actually going. Because I, you can hear like at Google, you can work four hours a day and you're just fine, you're just fine, right? Like at Facebook, you are just getting fired in half a year if you do that, or maybe even sooner. So first year was pretty tough just to adapt to a bigger company culture because everything is new to you. Like all the technologies are new. Uh, let's say the big companies have their own thing for everything, right? So let's say if the open world like and the open source world has, has Docker, they have their own system for managing containers. If the whole world has GitHub, uh, Facebook has its own like diffusion. So everything is kind of like native and mostly like scalable for the for this for the system for the scale of the company. Uh, later on, like you kind of adapt and basically you can deliver. But overall, I would say Facebook is a great place. I learned quite a lot over there, and I went through like the COVID situation as well. I don't know how it was in Central Asian countries. Like, like I know that in Kazakhstan, the restrictions were not so bad, right? Like maybe like for a month or two. But I would say at Facebook and Google and other companies in Bay Area, it's been already over 18 months that people are actually working from home. And it's actually quite stressing. So you don't see the people, like you don't see your peers. You actually communicate over Zoom and like well, internal video chats. And that's putting some toll. Like you don't have separation of the home and work environment. And yeah, there are some complications over there. And uh, yeah, it's been four years and I, I decided to take a break and I decided, oh, we, we had a daughter, like my daughter is gonna be six tomorrow, by the way. And Delicious. as you live, thank you. And as you live apart from like a family, so from your parents and your child is growing far away from the grandparents and cousins and other relatives, right? Aunts. Um, you kind of realize that like the family bonding and it's kind of, it's very important. And it's one of the most important things. And you see that the child is already like picking up English and the English is already becoming the first language. And there is like, oops, oops what is it? We're, we're still it. online, don't worry. I'll, I'll... Oh, okay. And uh, so, yeah, uh, we, me and my family, we decided to take a break. So I just left Facebook on good terms and uh, it was very understandable for my manager, from my upper management. And there is always an opportunity to come back, to return back. Actually at Facebook, you can return back within half a year without interview. But uh, I wanted to take a break until maybe like June, July of next year and just spend some more time with the family so that the kid grows closer to the grandparents and yeah, just to recharge and relax. Yeah. And I'm not actively looking for a job. So I'll be looking for a job when I'm back to the Bay Area in June or so. Oh, you have a long break then. Yeah, it's, it's, it's amazing. It's actually nice to reconsider what you want further in your career. Do you want to keep on working just like you were working? Or do you want to open your own thing? Maybe start a new startup or maybe come back to, the, to Kazakhstan, right? Like, because that's your home country. And when you're far away in the Bay Area, you have pretty much no one like close to you. You have some friends, of course, but still you're so far away from most of the peers and the people you actually used to work with, uh, the friends, uh, the family. So you got to weigh in and it's always a trade-off. So I'm happy to chat. If you guys have questions, uh, I'm happy to answer and dive deeper into some sections of what I just said. Awesome. Olafeka, do you have any questions? No, uh, thank you, Sergey. It was quite interesting discussion. Yeah, I mean, it's. Uh, I think maybe I will, I will ask a couple of questions. Maybe Zain will follow up, and maybe some of our students will. Uh, so it's interesting. Uh, 
yeah, to share your to to hear your story and uh, you know and it's interesting that also Facebook is also changing uh, shift shifting into virtual world with renaming itself to Meta. Yeah. Uh, so uh, so what what what's uh, obviously you know uh, students are maybe they have different interests. Might have uh, maybe different question. So what, what do you think about this for virtual world? I mean, obviously the COVID has accelerated shift into digital world, virtual world. And Facebook is also kind of one of, has become, I think the leading uh, technological company who has, uh, who's betting on this. Uh, yeah. With every, everything they have, yeah. So what, what do, do, do you think it's, uh, I mean, how, how, how uh, you used, did, did you see this coming working in the Facebook? This, this, this was a kind of step-by-step -step, uh, expected or the COVID has accelerated and then changed the mindset uh, of, of, the, you know, of the company. Sure. So yeah, I can answer this question uh, to my knowledge because uh, I would say I wasn't even close to product when I was working at Facebook. So that's just like a full disclosure because what I was doing, it was mostly about uh, big data technologies and Apache Spark and basically distributed systems. Uh, it was a type of stuff which I was able to do. Like I can go to Apple and do the same thing. I can go to Uber and do the same thing. And when you're very deep in the, in the infrastructure work, uh, you actually lose sometimes a, a bit of context about like what's going on on the product side. But I obviously have some opinion on this and uh, I can tell this interesting story. Like, like when you join Facebook, you actually realized that like the, the main campus, the classic campus of Facebook where I was working is based on the campus of Sun Microsystems. And um, if you actually know the logo like of Facebook or like right now it's actually Meta, if you go behind this logo, uh, there, you can see the logo of like the Sun Microsystems. So when Facebook moved into this building, these buildings, what they did, they just like uh, moved this brick around and just put their uh, logo like on the other side. And actually inside of uh, the Facebook campus, you can see some of the resemblance of from some microsystems. Uh, there is some crane, like crane uh, inside. So it's like people ask questions like, hey, what is this? And this is like from the past. So why Facebook keeps this stuff? Uh, so it's actually, it's, there is a nice philosophy over there behind this. Uh, the idea is that like, if you go back to some uh, to Bay area of like early 2000s and Sun Microsystems was the top place to work at. It was like the founder of Java, right? Like, and Java was like, was, de was developed by them. Everybody wanted to work there. They had the best compensation. They had, they were paying the best money. And later on, like, and they had like, uh, their bread and butter was like actually the service systems, like, like the service. And they had the Solaris servers and they were the best service in the world. So nobody could argue with this. But then like, uh, there was the crisis, right? Like 2007, and people actually started to have less money, right? Like you don't have much money to spend on like the expensive service. And at the same time, there was a rise of Linux operating systems and uh, more and more server, server like technologies and people were starting to serve their like web services and uh, websites on like Linux machines. And some systems was losing their positions though they, they didn't oversee this. And eventually they collapsed pretty much because they were acquired by Oracle and they, yeah, they pretty much died, right? And so Facebook keeps this as a reminder that uh, today you can be everything. You can be like the multi-billion uh, user company, but if you don't adapt quick enough, you can lose everyone and you can be nothing in just a year or two. Uh, so that's the main philosophy. And actually Facebook had to go through some stages. One of the major stages was uh, you remember the times when like everybody was using desktop computers and nobody was using smartphones because they were not there yet. And Facebook was running a lot of ads on Facebook uh, website. And then it's desktop, desktop application, right? It's a lot of space. It's a big screen. You can put a lot of ads. Everybody was happy. The revenue was going. But then like there was a shift in the technologies and people started to spend more time in, on their phones, right? Because there was iPhone released in 2007 or eight, I don't remember, but basically everybody was shifting to the phones and there was a big dilemma about, wait, how are we gonna make money? Because everybody is now looking at the screens, nobody's using the desktop applications. And actually right now, like the uh, 
mobile Facebook application is outweighing the desktop application by a lot. And so Facebook had to adapt to this and they actually were successful at this. Uh, they could survive this, but they could foresee this. And so what's important with Meta and with the transition to the uh, Metaverse is that it's probably going to be the right direction and it's the right bet, I would believe. Because let's say when they were just desktop computers, uh, people were spending on a screen maybe 20% of their time. Right now, everybody has phones and eventually we spend maybe like whatever, like 40 to 50% of our time on the screens. So, and then when it's going to be met, people are actually able to live in this world, right? Like you can just put on these goggles and you just live in the metaverse. And all the time when you're not sleeping, you can actually potentially spend there. You can still exercise, you can do like the games and stuff. So this is, this just makes sense. And because it's all just like the chase for the attention of the people, because keep human eyes is limited resource. Like, you either spend it, you're looking into Facebook or you're looking into Google or you're looking into YouTube. So everybody's competing. And I believe that's the right decision. And the fact that uh, Facebook is kind of removing Oculus, uh, uh, Oculus logo, because previously we had like Oculus and just like it was responsible for the VR. Right now it's going to be Meta only. And so Facebook is changing the direction. It understands that like just the web social network itself is not enough to maintain the company in the future. So that's my take on this. Thank you. Any questions from the audience? Yeah. Uh, hello, my name is Shol uh, I have the question. Um, uh, I think in the previous months or the three months, and uh, Facebook had uh, some issues. Be what uh, the Facebook uh, didn't work the some period, so. The Facebook is a lost their uh, billions values. Uh, what happened is in this situation? And uh, in second question, se uh, second question, maybe it's uh, uh, this situation uh, can, uh, could be the change the name of the Facebook. Do you do you have uh, some information? Uh, on that? Sure, I can only say my my personal opinion. I cannot speak for the company, obviously. But as you know, I've been like, I've been there for four years. And just when I joined in November 2017, or actually September 2017, there was US elections uh, held and Trump, Donald Trump won the elections. And right maybe in January or so, like of 2018, there was even a bigger scandal. And the scandal was about Cambridge Analytica. If you remember, there was some mm. information about the leaked information of the customers. I would say when I joined the company, the stock price was $170. And during Cambridge Analytica, it dropped to 120. So it was like 30, 40% drop like in the stock price. What's happening right now uh, is a little bit different. It's I, obviously Cambridge Analytica was a huge thing and company took a great hit, but later on it could actually recover uh, financially, right? Um, what's happening in the last few months, it's the information about the whistleblower, right? Uh, the Francis Hogan. Uh, I cannot comment much about her, about her uh, but uh, I would say that when you're so big and you have so many customers and you're actually becoming close to monopoly, uh, people might not like this, right? And but I believe that the companies like when the people the companies are so big like Facebook, um, they will actually survive and have more opportunities and tools to change things. So everybody is talking about the regulations, for example, in the US or about splitting Facebook or something like that. Maybe split WhatsApp, Instagram, and Facebook. But if you look deeper into this, uh, Facebook is kind of embracing the regulations. They are quite happy about like uh, government controlling some parts of this, doing a little bit of censorship because they can actually easily invest. When you're so big, you can easily invest into these regulations and adapt, right? But just imagine like if you have some small startup, which is also doing some social network or like TikTok or something like that. Uh, what you can actually afford easily is not so easy to afford for them. Uh, so I would say that might actually bring even more monopoly to the company. And uh, in the situation of Francis Hogan, I don't know her personally, obviously, 
but I know who she was. And my honest opinion is actually aligning with the official position of Facebook, what they said. So let's say I'm personally, I was like engineer level five, like L5. There were different engineering levels. Mm. That's like senior engineer. Mm. Uh, what she was, she was like a product manager. She wasn't a project manager or like she wasn't managing actual people. So she didn't have any direct reports and she wasn't part of any kind of like high level meetings, right? She had a bunch of information which was available for lots of people. Actually within Facebook, like many things and most of the documents or like, what? A lot of stuff is just shared and that's our problem of course because there are many leaks but at the same time it's very open com company and i just wouldn't agree that like she possessed any kind of information which was very like uh, unique or something like that and at the same time she wasn't really managing and she wasn't really, really like, at the position to influence the company that big because she was one of the i would say the level of like thirty thousand people or so so that's a very questionable thing. I think she has maybe good intentions, but at the same time, you can see some, uh, I don't know. So it's hard to comment. I just want to make sure that I don't get like sued about this, but I, mean, but I would say that it's kind of overblown a little bit and overreaction from the side of Congress because there was Congress hearing and like, all, and like everybody was like communicating to her. It's, it's kind of like weird show, I would say because she cannot say too much. She says that like, she can say that, hey, of course we can need to do better to influence the teenagers in Instagram and other things. But fundamentally, it's very hard question. And I wouldn't say like, she's like you know, the right person to represent or maybe like blow the whistle, like you know, so loud, I would say. Right. Yeah, and it's not obviously not related, of course, like uh, Facebook or Meta, I mean, Meta, uh, the change to Meta was uh, probably a decision which was made like long ago. Mm -hmm. Yeah. More questions, guys? Yes, yeah. I mean, if you guys don't have it, I'll have it. I have a question. Well, thank yeah. you so much for a lovely session. It's going very well. So the question is, we have here second year students at British Mount University and they are on the process of choosing their degree programs. So how was it for you like to choose your degree program and what to study? How did you decide and how to come up with an idea that you want to do this thing in, for the future? Yeah, that's a good question. Actually, I have a nice story about this. So I had a dream just like as, a, as I was coming from a very small town. Uh, you don't know much, right? You don't know much, much about like Stanford or MIT. At the time, I didn't even have like a lot of internet connection, I would say. And for us, like Kazakh British Technical University was like the top of the tier university, it was just like, and go, right? And okay, so, oh, you, you guys maybe know about this university, but it, it's, it was pretty nice. I, I don't know, it's pretty good right now as well, but actually it's pretty small. If you look at this, there are only four directions. There is like oil and gas industry, uh, there is management and finance, and there is like computer science, right? Well, actually three directions. And so I was just like going outside of the university and reading these like brochures about the different specialties. I, I had my, had a chance to read about management and I was like, okay, I don't understand what is this. And I read about the finance. I was like, uh, that's not something I want to do. Uh, oil and gas. Um, I didn't want to work in the oil and gas industry. And actually my mom works in, in the gas industry. And so I didn't want to follow her steps as well. So and I also heard that like computer science was kind of tough and like they have the toughest math uh, challenges over there. So, okay, I, I just wanted to take the challenge. And honestly, like when you were like, I don't know, like I, I had a feeling that like uh, I wanted to choose some kind of specialty, which is where you could actually be uh, multiple heads ahead of other people and just make sure there is no any kind of okay, this guy is brother of somebody, he can do this work, right? Or like, instead of you, like, so you're not taking this job, which is very often the case in, in the finance and management systems. Like, it's, I don't know, in Kazakhstan, I believe, it, I was always believing it was like that. So, of course, there's like, like top-notch uh, economists and managers, but still, I was very worried that I could actually be restricted from the opportunities just because I didn't have any connections. And in computer science, I mean, you either can code or you cannot code, right? Or like you either can build systems or you cannot. And nobody else can do this just because he's some relative of somebody else, right? Like, 
So that's that's what the reason why I actually like this. And I was into computers, but I wouldn't say it was. I was just more like disassembling my computer and like looking up like looking at the hard disk drive and other things, reinstalling the operating system. And I thought, okay, it might be the similar thing, but it was not. It was completely new new stuff. But I I, I would say I, I was happy that I joined it. Uh, I chose this path and I just found myself over there. It could be easily that like I chose, I, I, knew, I knew many students who were, let's say, golden medalists and other stuff. But yeah, I was actually counting this, like out of 28 group mates of mine uh, who studied in during my year, only seven ended up working on the specialty, you see? Wow. Uh, even though like most of the students were golden medalists and some of them were Olympiads programmers, well, those who were Olympiad programmers, they ended up to be programmers. <laughs> but like many of the folks had actually had amazing background, but they just chose the specialty which was not correct for them. And if you look at the American universities, for example, let's say you join Stanford or MIT. Uh, if you join from internally from the US, uh, you actually get a chance to poke at different things, right? Like you can look at, okay, you do some basic fund fundamental programs and then you try this, try that, and then eventually you decide like where you want to go. Or you have a major, but then you have a different minor. So I would say like US is kind of better in this sense. And, and maybe there are less people who actually find themselves not like uh, interested in the field. But in my case, in the Kazakh British Technical University, if you chose it wrongly, wrongfully, and you don't actually enjoy this and you don't like this, uh, you end up in a bad spot. Yeah. Wow. Awesome. Thank you so uh, much. That's for why we have a saying. That's why we have a saying. You know, you need to have forty uh, skills or talents <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> to be successful. No, you have to be ready. Yeah, you're right. I mean, uh, even even Elon Musk. You know, if you talk about Elon Musk, he's uh, he's not skilled in one area. So he's cross uh, expert in many areas: physics, business. Uh, so now nowadays, I think you need the, the more skills you have, the, the better your chances of. Uh, yeah. I, I would agree on that and also like uh, the better you can actually adapt uh, the better you are because yeah. the times when you could actually say become an engineer in the United USSR for example in USSR you become an engineer and you start working on a factory and just work there for 30 years those times are pretty much gone like in the modern world right uh, in the world of technology I cannot say that I will be doing the same thing or like similar thing like maybe 30 years from now so is the question of how quickly you can adapt to this. Yeah. Wow, awesome. And um, one more question. Yeah, what maybe was your more. Why one more? Yeah. <laughs> I'm actually asking myself, what was your day like at Facebook, like regular day? Can you just tell us what, ha what happens like from what time to what time you work, what time you wake up, what time you log mm -hmm. off? Well, it depends on like what period of time, but let's say, Maybe some of the best times I had. One person wants to join. Hmm? Just for one minute. Just say hi. Hmm? With his mentor. Huh? Okay. All right. Yeah, there is, I think there is a person who wants to join to our so, okay. <clears throat> session. Sure. I'm, I'm inviting one person for one minute. He wants to greet you. Is it Nurjan? Do, do you want to guess who? Nurjan? Yes, who? No. Ramesh. Ramesh. No, oh, no, Ramesh. no. No, no, no. I, I don't know. I'm just guessing. <laughs> Third plus the 10. <laughs> I stopped guessing. I'm not telling. <laughs> it's a surprise. Is he joining via Zoom, right? Yeah, right now. Okay, cool. <clears throat> is, is somebody in the waiting room? No, there is no one in the waiting room. Assalamu alaikum. Assalamu alaikum. Just turn on your video. <laughs> Can we see you? We, we, we missed your face. <laughs> yeah. Sorry, sorry, sorry. Where? Are, oh, yes, good. <laughs> Hi, <Have> everyone. <laughs> yeah, it's really nice to hear from you guys. Uh, Mark, uh, spe special salam from Baku. <laughs> oh, thank you. <laughs> so, uh, spe uh, so, my special um, hello from Baku to all of our students. Uh, BMU, uh, please, what does mean BMU? British Management British University. Management University, sir. Oh, great, 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 great. 
So uh, my congratulations to everyone. My, uh, I, I'd like to really great success. And uh, believe me, I'm pretty sure that uh, uh, what, what you do. Oops. Is it on that his end? Poor connection, yeah, yeah, I think. Uh, he was, he's a very excited, I like to his face. He's very cheerful, <laughs> very joyful. That's why, that's yeah, why I, love I, love him. Him. I, lo I love him already. <laughs> he was, he was the father of IT, IT uh, faculty. Huh? Wow. <laughs> Such a nice person. Students call him father. Oh, really? Papa. Yeah. Papa? He's Papa. Yeah. Godfather. Godfather. <laughs> 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 Yeah. Oh, yeah. 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 He is originally from Azerbaijan, but he worked for many years in Kazakhstan. Yeah. In uh, Suleiman in Demiral University, and mm -hmm. then he joined Kazakh British Technical University as a dean, and then finally he was vice rector. Wow. And after that, Fuad Bey joined Nazarbayev University. Um, I can't remember his position there, but it was one of the top positions. Awesome. And I think there, he's in. There he is. Yeah. So he joined again. And he led this uh, programming contest movement. Sir, your microphone is mute. So uh, thank you very much, Tima. Thank you very yes. much for, for <laughs> a nice presentation of me. <laughs> uh, many thanks. I just I, I joined you for just for a couple of for a couple of minutes and just for to say thank you very much to our audience. Thank you and express my warm wishes from Baku and maybe from Kazakhstan also because I am physically here in Baku, but my heart in Kazakhstan also. <laughs> and maybe starting from this time, from this minute, maybe beat, my heartbeat will be in Uzbekistan also. <laughs> oh, thank you so much. <laughs> uh, good luck, guys. Good luck and thank you very much. Unfortunately, I have to be in the meeting now. And so uh, again, good success for everyone. Mark, Galib, Hi. thank you very much again. Thank you for all this. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, sir. Have a good day. Thank you. Yeah, so much energy. <laughs> energy. Out of yeah, we need his energy, positive energy. We yeah. <laughs> right. And it's Friday, we need that. <laughs> so, so maybe, uh, Zane, you know, uh, maybe I won't. I won't I will ask a couple of questions that may be useful for students, unless they have questions. That would be awesome. Yeah, so, uh, uh, Sergey, you know, obviously we know a lot of our students are not IT, they don't have IT background, but they, they will probably need IT background to be successful in their careers now. Uh, so what, what's, what's, what's your uh, kind of recommendation on how, how to, uh, or what to learn on how, how to learn it? Uh, yeah, thank you. Uh, how to learn it yeah or maybe just any ideas because you probably you work with business right so if you work if you let's say there is a, in it comments teams you have business uh, you have uh, kind of it uh, developers and then you you kind of integrate uh, and, and talk with them uh, about these new products so there's business side domain knowledge side and then there's it side yeah but i would say the majority of the if you just like break down the population, right? Like, and there's just a vast majority of engineers. And then like after engineers, there are engineering managers, but engineering managers are the people who used to be engineers and then transitioned into the management domain. Right. Engineering management. It's because they are people managers. They have to be proficient in technologies. And yeah. So, so it's actually, I would say in like in big tech companies, it's more like a parallel tracks. You can be an engineer until the end of your life, right? And 
You can be, let's say, a C6, a level six, or you can be a manager, manager one. You can be level seven, manager two, and et cetera. Those are just parallel tracks. Right. I cannot speak much about the business component because I didn't really interact much with uh, people uh, from business side. Uh, it was mostly like technical prog program managers, uh, people who have some technical background, but are still into more like connecting pieces together and more working on the vision of the company or organization. So, yeah, I would say that if you want to get into big tech or Bay Area Silicon Valley, uh, the easiest way is to be proficient in computer sciences. Uh, that's the way to go. Uh, or like, uh, I don't want to kind of like cut this like short like this and it's like, okay, sorry guys. <laughs> and um, I, th I think there's obviously many different ways uh, to pursue this. Uh, I just don't have like uh, my expertise on that. And I just, I'm just speaking from the side of like the population, right? So the majority of the population are close to the computer science. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. So, but you can always anyone... choose a minor, of course, like the minor. Yeah, that's what we are. We are trying to do it here yeah. at no cost, at no cost to our students. So we will be giving them uh, information systems, uh, some Python uh, introduction to programming, something like that. So, so they have some skills and maybe upper hand in the job market when, you know, the opportunity arises. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, but there is a big shortage of, of engineers, I would say that. And I just like personally see this from like the terms of like, let's say salaries distribution, like, let's say engineers compared to like other people in the same, like um, similar positions, but in other fields, let's say recruiting or analy analysts or other things, even data scientists, um, they're all like paid much less uh, as compared to software engineers. Yeah. So that's basically the top of the chain. So ha have you seen some people who does who didn't have any IT background, nothing, and then they they prepared themselves and they became developers. So you do you need a degree in in, uh, in engineering or computer science to be uh, to become a developer? Uh, yes, I've seen some people like that, and um, it's not a requirement to have a degree. Uh, but if you want to enter the big tech, the reality is that like you need to have some experience. Uh, so let's say. You, you don't go ahead and join Facebook right away or like Google right away without a degree just because you finished some coding bootcamp. And uh, you, you gain some experience in other smaller, smaller companies, in smaller startups. And after, let's say, maybe like three, four years in experience in smaller companies, you can actually use your experience as a degree and you just apply for the big, bigger tech companies. At the same time, all the companies have uh, programs for people who don't have engineering background, who don't have bachelor's or master's in the computer science. But it's, those are limited programs. So I, I had a chance to work with a, such a rotational engineer. I say they, they take you for a long internship, which is called apprenticeship. And you're basically spending in the company for half, half a year. And you work like as an engineer. And then like after, at the end, if, you, if your ratings are good and if you get good feedback from your peers, you are basically taken as an engineer uh, for the position of an engineer without a college degree. So I had, uh, I had a few people that I knew who actually uh, became engineers this way. But at the same time, they had the skills, right? Like, and how you gain the skills, uh, you probably have to work somewhere else. Yeah, thank you. Actually, my wife right now, she's like, she likes this field and she likes coding, but she doesn't have computer science background. So she actually did that graduate from a boot camp, but it was pretty hard to find opportunities uh, in companies, especially during COVID, because all those like apprenticeship programs or like internship programs, I would say, um, they require more mentorship, like from the people. Let's say you take somebody for half a year and you kind of like, uh, you have to spend some time to mentor them a little bit. But uh, during COVID, it's really hard. And so many of the companies just, they just cancel these apprenticeship programs. But some of them, of course, reopened, but the competition there is so huge. It's like hundreds or like whatever like people that want to apply there. So right now we are back to Kazakhstan and my wife is doing master's degree in computer science right now, just to get more like opportunities to, to basically get selected for interviews. Because right now it's even hard, without a degree, it's even hard to get an opportunity to be interviewed for the companies. Yeah. Well, that's kind of the reality. I would say that.
Thank you so much. And I think it's time is coming up. We have to wrap up the session. And do you have any final thoughts to our students? Um, yeah, it was a pleasure talking. I, I hope I was hoping I would get more questions from like uh, more students, but I just hope that the session was valuable and I want to wish everyone good luck. It was. Just don't forget forget my why my words about uh, the reputation. So basically, we have to build our have reputation from the beginning. Exactly, exactly. Be a nice person. Be a nice team player, uh, and this will actually pay off in the future because yeah. things opportunities will just pop up in the future, like eventually on their own. Uh, if you're not a great person to work with, if you are not responsible, uh, that's that's going to be a problem in the future. Yeah. I would say that just by the reputation, you kind of get the connections and things, are, opportunities are appearing in your life. Yeah. And the thing I learned in the, while working in the U.S. corporate world is also uh, the value of uh, asking questions if you don't know. Yeah. So, oh, uh, so uh, Golip, Golip actually Harvard graduate. He graduated from Harvard mm -hmm. uh, with master's yeah. degree, master's in public yeah, I worked a couple of years in New York and UBS and Bank of America. So I... I know this uh, value of, uh, you know, as uh, uh, you, you rightly pointed out, positive attitude is, is really, really important. People really need to like you. Then uh, then the second important thing is ability to ask questions when you don't know. And it's of, in our culture, it's very kind of, uh, we are lean and, and like backward people here. So we are really shy to ask any questions, but uh, you know, there you have to ask questions and that's how you learn actually most of the things. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I commend it. Yeah. Okay, Sergey, thank you very much. It was thank you. very, very valuable. Thank you. Thank you. It was a pleasure talking to you. Good luck. Good luck in your next stage. <laughs> thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Good luck, guys. Thank thank you. Thank you. Campus Uzbekistan. Yeah. Visit, yeah, we, will, visit. we invite you to our campus. You have okay, so maybe, much time maybe. in Kazakhstan. I'm pretty close yes. here. Yeah, yeah, we will feed you. <laughs> you probably miss <laughs> <it's like> food. <laughs> All right. All right. Okay. Bye bye. Thank you so okay. much. Have a good, good day. Bye bye. Bye. Thank you.